Um, so we are going to record the session. Uh, so if you don't want to kind of be in the video, we will be sharing it on YouTube, sharing it around to the group, and then maybe keep your video off uh, or let us know and we can edit a bit out if you want to speak and put your video on. Um, but yeah, welcome to the group. So um, as you all know, this is a group for writers, producers, directors, and, and designers and other creatives uh, to just get together once a month. We used to socialize um, in, a, in a pub, uh, in the cellar of a pub sometimes, uh, but obviously we can't do that right now. Uh, but it's, it's really nice to get together even though it's virtual. And the purpose of the group is that we meet uh, a really amazing uh, kind of industry figure or professional uh, in the field uh, and we get to, to sort of ask them lots of questions and, and learn from them um, and sort of just chat. So uh, that person today is, uh, is Amina Hammond um, and she's a producer and I'll embarrass her a little bit um, by, doing, by doing a little bit of an intro uh, about Amina. Um, so Amina is the company director uh, as well as the creative producer of Amina Hammond Productions. So she's an independent London-based producer. And Amina, do jump in and correct me if I sort of uh, get things wrong. Um, and uh, Amina produces work and actually kind of champions work as well as producing it, because those are two different things. Um, and she champions work that brings uh, people of color, LGBTQ+, uh, those who identify as disabled, women and genderqueer theatre makers to the stage. So that's the kind of real mission statement uh, of her work. Um, and the, the kind of, I think the latest show you produced, again, do correct me, was Teddy Lamb's Since You've Been Gone, uh, which was a real success and was supposed to be touring at the moment, maybe? Yes, yeah, well, it was, it was meant to be touring in October. We pushed it to spring, so we'll see. Amazing. Uh, we're very much paying attention to whatever happens, but hopefully. Um, but yeah, uh, welcome to the Fimber Forum, Amina. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Um, I'm going to, I'm trying to figure out which of you is best so I don't just have to stare at my own face. Okay. But, um, <laughs> I think I've got it now. Great. So um, I'll kick off by asking Amina some questions uh, and then sort of, you know, 20 minutes in, um, just watch the clock. Uh, we'll open the floor to everyone else. Uh, and what we'll do is um, you can sort of just pop your question in uh, the chat and then I'll ask you to unmute yourself and then you can, you can ask your question. So do think of your questions and keep hold of them. You will have your chance. Uh, okay, so just to kick things off, it's always really interesting to know how people sort of find their way uh, into something. And I think, especially producing, maybe this is just me, but it always feels quite mysterious. I'm like, well, how do you become a producer and, and what do you actually do? And um, so I'd just love to hear about sort of how you got started and how you sort of founded a, your own company and your journey to that. Yeah, um, well, I, I think you're right in that it is quite mysterious, but it's mainly mysterious because nobody goes about and goes, oh, do you know what? I want to be a producer because nobody knows what that is at a young age. Um, but I've been producing for two years now and I very much fell into it. Um, so I started with, what did I actually, this is a good question, where did I start? <laughs> um, so essentially I started with just uh, do it, doing it, <laughs> essentially, um, but in the way of very much fringe theatre where it's a show where everyone's got 50 different jobs and you're not just the producer but you're also somehow the sound designer and the lighting designer and, and everything. Um, and then from that I went, do you know what, I quite like the spreadsheet bit, I quite like this bit, this must be a job. Um, I did a course with the National Theatre and then I found my first job on Twitter um, and although I wouldn't do it now, it was on expenses only, so I didn't lose any money, but I didn't make anything. Um, and I went and took a show to Sheffield uh, Local Theatre and to Buxton Fringe, um, and I did quite well up there. And then I just started applying for things and going, do you know what, if I call myself a producer, enough people will believe it. So you, you do that for a bit. Um, and I did a, a load of work in two years. So I worked at Nuffield Southampton Theatres as a producing assistant. Um, so obviously that's quite sad for us right now. Um, I worked, at, so I worked there and then I went on to go kind of, this is great, it's really good, but I really want to make work specifically to champion people. That's why I came into the industry. And, and so I went, well, I guess I'm going to have to set up my own company. How do you actually do that? And what do you do? Uh, found out more about that. And I actually met Teddy probably, <laughs> like, well, last year in, in August, um, I met them in Edinburgh 
and we sort of went through this coffee in October with this idea of going well I'm just going to talk you through how, like what you need when you're looking for a, a new producer and then Teddy emailed me and went I'd like you to be my new producer <laughs> um and so I picked up that show I picked up a show that went to the old red lion um as a co-producer so that was a Christmas run which if you've not done it it's hard <laughs> it's a hard one um and then, yeah, and then I just sort of got, kept getting recommended for jobs. So since the first job I ever did, I've been really lucky in that I've just been recommended for things. I've not actually applied for a job mm -hmm. since then, oh, wow. um, which is very strange in, in this. <laughs> um, but it's something very weird about the industry is that I, I suppose everyone knows each other. Um, mm -hmm. and I, my, yeah, and so I, that's how I ended up doing that. But I think I figured it out that I've worked on 20 different shows in two oh, wow. years in different capacities. So it's been busy. <laughs> um, I will say that it's been busy. And and now obviously things are much quieter. Um, you say that. You, know? um, <laughs> you just yeah. Well, no. Um, There's a whole lockdown I section. Like, of questions, I, but. <laughs> always the way. I think. Um, yeah, I, I I was actually meant to be taking the summer off as well, which is really funny because I I don't do days off, um, which is which is not good, and I don't recommend <laughs> it for anyone but it's just how, how I've been, been living and so I went oh well I'll take this summer um and then obviously everything happened and I had a show meant to be going to Battersea Arts Centre that got cancelled and and then I had to push a tour and actually this summer became extremely busy and then everyone wanted to make digital work um and so it's just been it's been a lot busier but I think I am very much a person that can't sit still um so in it's been a blessing in disguise I think for me um to have a lot to do and a lot of different work and and planning for 2021 is quite nice because you get to look forward and remember that like yeah. this doesn't have to be it um there's more yeah. out there and maybe it's great to hear that you're still busy and and, and kind of 20 shows in two years sounds like uh, a lot of work so a little rest as well um but I'd love to hear a little bit about your R&D process so with writers um, or, or theatre makers, um, so just sort of what that looks like on one of one of your productions and how um, and I think especially especially writers uh, uh, like myself are always just really interested in how something goes from being an idea or the sort of first time you meet some, a person or um, that you commission someone and how then that finds its way to the stage because again and um, those processes can can often be mysterious for a lot of, a lot of makers and um, so yeah I'd love to just hear about that. Um, so I, I actually exclusively at the moment work with new writing which is really great fun um, because I love it because I think it, it, it's also the best place as well to find people who are making work that is that fits the criteria that I want to produce. Um, and the, the great thing about it is there's so many people out there with ideas. So usually I'll get an email that will vary between literally three lines um, of like, I have this kind of thing that I think, um, and full scripts. And so it, like, it very much depends on what I get from, from a person. Mm -hmm. um, but usually people bring ideas to me. I have ideas, I just haven't had any time to, to <laughs> um but that is that is the way that it works for me and it's it's yeah it's very dependent on the show but there'll be shows like the one that was meant to go to Bastille Arts Centre that will come to me as something that's done in R&D or something that's kind of had this idea bouncing around now has a space um or someone needs a space and I'll, I'll find them one and we'll go from there and it usually will be okay where are we applying to get funding for you so that you can get paid to write the thing and devise the thing however however that may be um, I am, it's very important to me that people get paid. Uh, I, that doesn't sound like it's revolutionary, but I think it is. And I think writers especially are so frequently expected to just mm -hmm. like write a full script and then turn around with, with oh, well, we're not going to put your fee in the Arts Council budget because you've already written it. Like it's, and I think that's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, so for me, it's very much about going, like starting with that idea and of where you see it. Um, I think that can change so much in the process as well so it like oh, the number of things I'm working on at the moment though <laughs> is just sort of like all over the place but I got something from a writer uh that was sort of like I'm gonna I'm gonna change it but say <laughs> they said um I, I really want to write a musical about ducks and I've that's I've actually got a really great idea of what the theatre will look like when people come in and that's all I've got so far and I'll go, okay, well, the idea about ducks sounds good. And this is a really good <laughs> subject and something that people haven't explored before. 
um, and you've got and you've clearly like you've been thinking about it enough to know what you want the mirror to look to look like. Um, I think if a writer is passionate about an idea, you can tell, and that is a really good that's a really important starting point. Mm -hmm. Um, because even if you're like, here's five pages that I've written, I've not gotten any further because I have a day job or I have something else to do that just means that I can't get any further. Um, I think that's fine, but really it's, it's about, and it's about finding a producer as well that makes work that fits with you because at the beginning there is that moment of kind of, okay, we're going to put in a funding application together and find a way of getting some money to do that first R and D process. And the way that it works for me is I'll usually go, okay, you can kind of have this week of doing whatever you need to do. And then we'll have like a two month gap. And then you have another two weeks with actors in the room. Um, and it might be that on the end of that, nothing comes out of it and that's fine. <laughs> you might just have an industry sharing at the end and you might go, do you know what? There's nowhere for it right now. Mm -hmm. But you get, you have that, spent that time developing a piece that then can go to a theater or can go like mm -hmm. wherever it needs to go or wherever it needs to be and sometimes that might be that you go do you know what this piece isn't for theatre it's for film and I need to take it down a different route yeah. but it's really about just giving the writer the space and the time mm -hmm. to and and to be fair three weeks is not enough time but it, it's one of those things where you're like we're balancing with funding and what we can and can't do um but it's really about giving the space and the time for that project to develop and it might be that you go through those three weeks and then you go okay this we've got something really good here mm -hmm. and we've invited all these venues to come and see it or we've been talking to them about it um and then you kind of talk to them and you go okay how are we going to put this together or it still needs a little bit of development so mm -hmm. like what what are you going to give us and what we're going to give you it's really about negotiating that um and i think as a producer supporting new writing that's the really key thing is developing that and developing the relationship with your writer where you can be really honest with them because sometimes i have to go back to writers and just go there are just no venues that i can put it in right now because it's just not going to work and if you can't if you don't feel like you can go back to the person and say that it's not the right relationship right yeah. um because you've, it, you, and, you, and it's partly because you've got to prove that your heart is just as much in it as their heart is. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that it's, I find it really difficult to say no to shows, but I know when I need to, because there's stuff that just doesn't fit with what I should be producing to fit my brief and to fit what I want to do. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that when I get emails from writers and I'll get shows through that I'll, I'll go, this just doesn't really fit with what I do. And you can tell that they've not looked at anything that you've done. Right, okay. And it's not, it's not rude. It's not problematic. Like it's fine to do that. But I know that for me and for a lot of producers on, on the fringe and off West end, it's very important that you kind of have an idea of what you make and you have a brand in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, and I have like built a reasonably distinct one <laughs> as much as you can in two years. Mm -hmm. um, so I, yeah, I feel like it's very important to just check what, the producer does and to, and to email them and, and go what is your R&D process and how, how does that work yeah. for you um, because other people do it differently to the way I do it and some people go okay you have to bring me a full script or you have to bring me nothing at all and we'll work together on it um, it's really about looking at what their process is like or emailing a writer that they've worked with and going hey I'm really interested in the, this producer I make work that's a little bit similar to yours mm -hmm. um, what's the best way of going about well, like how does it work with them and they might email you back and go don't go for that producer they're a terrible person <laughs> that's fine um, but it's really just like doing your research and, and asking around I think um the reason that like I've gotten work is because people will talk to other people and find me that way so I think that's the best that's the best way to find the producer that's going to do the work for you and you might be talking to your friend that's also a writer who goes oh do you know what actually like this idea sounds just like something that this producer would work on um, and that's the best way to go about it. Yeah. I feel like I've not answered the question, but hopefully yeah, that's yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> um, So just kind of thinking about that point where you have a sharing, for example, and you've got venues coming in, and um, that some, sometimes can feel like a point where, um, let's say you don't get programmed or you do, a show doesn't go on and you're like, why hasn't it gone on? Or how do I actually get it on? I guess it would be really interesting to find out um, and this is kind of, you know, obviously the old, the old world, pre-lockdown we're talking, but um, uh, what, what kind of shows in your experience do get picked up or how much kind of luck is, <laughs> is at play or, or how much is it about who you know or um, what are the things that get in the way, I guess, as well, of, of shows going on? I think sometimes it is absolutely about 
um, luck in it is just about the timing. Um, because for example, if you look at shows that are on, like it, it, this is very specific, but if you look at the shows that are going to be on after after lockdown ends and in the same way that like after the 2008 recession, mm -hmm. people want to see comedies, so comedies get programmed. And like it is sometimes just the luck of the draw and when, you're, when your show falls and it, you're like, oh, my show is done. You, you do need to kind of have a two year period where you're okay with it going on at any point in those two years, as long as it's on. Um, so it is sometimes about luck and it and it can ease as just as much be about who you know but but i i hate saying that because i think like but when i came into the industry i didn't know anyone <laughs> and now i know a lot of people <laughs> but i like i did not know anyone at all and that is literally a producer's job is to know people and to know the right people um so it, it can just be about sending the email to the right person mm. but it really is it's about research because if you if you go to if one of you are doing a show and you go do you know what actually this is not going to be the right audience for it now because now's just not the time that people want to see this type of work um or you go to a theater that goes this just isn't the work that we program i know some venues where i'll go do you know what this isn't the show to tour to this venue because i know the programming team or i know yeah. like what they've programmed before um so I, this is like part of the reason that I didn't, I, I left working at Nuffield Theatre is because they just didn't really have a great audience for black theatre yeah. in terms of they just didn't have a black audience or really an audience for that as, as well. Um, and it, it, they have a really, really great audience there and they have a really well cultivated one, mm -hmm. but the theatre I wanted to make wouldn't have a great audience there. Um, and so I know when I'm taking a show somewhere and, and if I'm going, oh, should I email this venue or that venue? I'll go, well, this venue has just programmed work that's like it and, and it's been really successful there. Or this venue has, hasn't has ever programmed work that's like it and actually really needs it. Um, so it is, it is something sometimes about thinking about that. But the main thing and the main piece of advice that I have is always look outside of London. Um, one, because London theatre rent can be really expensive. Um, and I think if you're a new writer, it can be really helpful to, to do it in a, to, yeah. in a regional venue first. Um, and also regional venues can be really receptive to working with you on work, which mm -hmm. is great. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of London venues who are like that as well. The Fimber is really great at working with people on work. Um, I know because I aggressively email Neil all of the time. <laughs> um, but it's it like there's loads of really great places outside of London as well to look at. Um, which often get forgotten because everyone thinks L London is the goal. Yeah, um, and, and if you can find somewhere that really chimes with your work or you're from somewhere outside of London and you go, do you know what, I'd really like to take this mm -hmm. back home. Mm -hmm. um, it's, a, it's a really great way to, st to start developing and to, to get in with their artist development department and for them to really support you if they can um, is always really good. And there are really great venues in London which do the same thing. Um, <laughs> So if you are from London, you can do the same thing. Yeah, but yeah I think definitely put place value on regional theatres as well mm -hmm. because they, they'll probably give you something. Yeah. Great. I'm just going to pause quickly. I think there's a request on the chat for people to turn off their videos um, just so that it's a bit clearer um, to hear Amina uh, and us chat. Um, so if you can, not you Amina, you can keep, keep it on. <laughs> but if, if other people can just turn them off. Um, Cool. Uh, so the next question, sort of moving moving on into into the the kind of the elephant in the room, which is you know the lockdown and, and, and the current state of, of play and the fears, I guess, and anxieties that are that are happening. And I'm sure that we've all been having those conversations, um, you know, with with different people in the industry, friends, people we know, colleagues, um, and you know that obviously uh there's a bit of a fear at the moment and an anxiety that we're going to be kind of moving backwards when it comes to diversity uh, when it comes to the diversity of the voices that are on stage um, like you were mentioning earlier there's going to be a certain appetite for work and also other things are going to be prioritized and a lot of the work is going to be unpicked and and um, so I, I just someone as someone who's championing voices and is sort of here to do that um, and your your company um, what are your feelings on that or uh, kind of do you have the same fear I think I think it's something that that is that could possibly happen however I, I would say that I don't have the same fear mainly because of the fact that this lockdown has coincided with a period that has been so activist and so mm -hmm. and I and it doesn't feel like it's felt before mm -hmm. um, it, it feels like a, a genuine shift 
and I think a lot of people are actually starting to listen to different voices and want to hear those voices. Um, so I, I think I'm hopeful. I think that it, it won't happen and that it won't go that way. I do think some bigger venues are absolutely going to go, do you know what, we're going to play it safer in our larger spaces, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that they can't keep like taking slight risks on other work. Mm -hmm. um, but really part of what I do is proving that actually this work isn't a risk because it's always seen as that. Yeah. Um, but proving that work because it's by people of color or by LGBTQ plus people or by women, um, <laughs> it, that doesn't matter. Um, it's just as, it's just as viable, um, as mm -hmm. work. And I think, I mean, you can see it in, in the TV shows people have been watching. Um, and like I may destroy you is up is written by a black woman. Mm -hmm. Um, so like it's, it's absolutely like, it's definitely not the time to be playing it safe. People are paying attention to stories that are, that are important. Um, but I, it's about, it's going to be a bit of a fight, I think, mm -hmm. and it is going to be a battle on those fronts, but it's, mm -hmm. it's really easy to kind of go, no, actually we've made steps in this lockdown period and there's just, there's no reason to be going backwards mm -hmm. because people have proved that they, there is an appetite for the work by diverse people, like by mm -hmm. people from everywhere and by people who identify as everything. So I like, I, it's a, it's a, it's a reasonable fear to have mm -hmm. and I think there is absolutely a chance that some venues will go we don't want to program your work because it's just not safe for us mm -hmm. but that is more of an issue with the venue at that point and you should really be challenging that um but I wouldn't say I wouldn't say that I'm fearful that people will stop programming because like it's not as safe or because of um <laughs> that but it will be it will be a bit of a fight I think great answer I like that answer <laughs> um the the other question sort of again about the kind of state of things is that you know this is the day after the the, the, the kind of long-awaited bailout was announced and um, which was followed by sort of mini twitter storms everywhere and everyone with differing opinions some people feeling very hopeful others feeling very cynical and um, some people just sort of being like i don't know um, but there is a lot of talk about sort of the potential to reimagine um sort of theater and how it's structured uh, which is really exciting and like you were saying this is a time of activism and that, that we are taking steps forward even in lockdown you know there's this huge surge and um i'd just love to 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 know what kind of theater and um, kind of future theater um, as we emerge from this that you imagine or that you hope for um somebody once said to me i feel like this is the thing that comes to mind but somebody once said to me that because i am a black woman making theater everything i make will always be political um and i don't want that to be the case <laughs> um i think like when i was younger the theater that i watched and, and mainly it was musicals and big commercial musicals that were tall um the theater that i watched was just fun and it was stories that people could relate to and that was what was important about it um and i think for me the future of theater is is the ability of people to tell stories and of people from from underrepresented of underrepresented voices, the ability to tell stories that aren't just about their trauma—that's all I want. It seems like a big ask, but I think um, there's a lot of other ways in which theatre needs restructuring, and there's a lot of there's a lot of support that needs to be put in place for people um, making those steps up and for emerging artists and for kind of that in between emerging and established yeah, artists yeah, as well, particularly. Yeah. Um, but for me, in terms of looking at underrepresented voices, I think it's, it's about time we started to listen to them on anything and not just on like what it means to, to experience racism or what it means to experience that. Um, because it, yeah, that, that's what I hope for the ability to tell a story, not based on who you are, but based on anything. Yeah. What you want to say about the world. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much um, for answering all my questions. I'm ga now going to open up to the floor, uh, the Zoom floor. Um, so yeah, if anyone wants to ask a question, uh, just pop your name in the, in the, what is it, the chat. Uh, if you just pop your name in the chat uh, and then I'll call your name out, you can unmute yourself and, and, and speak. Okay, let me just open the chat. Ooh, very quiet, uh, very quiet out there. Any questions at all? Maybe I can't see. Sue, have you got any questions coming through? Oh, here we are. Great, we're starting. Cool. So, Alex, do you want to unmute yourself and and uh, and ask your question? 
yeah hi that was really interesting i enjoyed that very much just to let you know i'm sort of new to this so what i asked might not be suitable for this forum um but you mentioned that what and, and i'm part of the questers theater um um alex marker asked me to come along and and i work with new writing um, and you mentioned about um i think it was the nuffield you said that you left because you couldn't you you, you didn't think the audience was you could find the right audience for some of the work you wanted to work with. You specifically meant it, men, mentioned black audiences that you were after. Do, do you think that if you if a theatre programmes enough of the right plays to attract, I mean, is it chicken or egg? Do we, do we attract the right audience by programming the right plays or because it's a really tough one, you know, even we're in the middle of Ealing, which is quite a multicultural part of London um, and we find it difficult to attract audiences that are not you know your traditional white middle-class theatre audience um, I think it's I mean it's a really interesting question <laughs> and definitely one that I've thought about a lot yeah um, I think for me it's it's really important to kind of do both um, so it's not so much a chicken and egg situation it's a little bit more fluid than that um, mm -hmm. in that I think it, a lot of it comes from community outreach um, and really establishing not just like getting your community in and going here's some cheaper tickets for you but going what work do you want to see because we've got this theatre space and we want to know what you want to see in it um, and it might be that they don't want to see what you think at all and that is absolutely fine but now you've learned and you've got that link um, and also kind of finding people from the community to make work with you, whether it doesn't necessarily have to be traditional theatre work, um, but really creating that link there, but also understanding that sometimes there are just people who don't want to see theatre. I think that's a big thing that, that we, we don't really, we don't really tackle a lot, um, that there are just people who won't be in our audience because it's just not something they want to do. Um, and that is absolutely fine. But, and, and it's a lot about breaking down spaces. There's a really great paper um, by a sociologist called Dr. Nicola Rollock that's about uh, middle class spaces and how the black middle class doesn't feel as, as welcome in those spaces because they still see them as white spaces. And it's, it's places like theatres, it's places like that. Um, and it is really about breaking that down. And I, and I think that post lockdown, there's the opportunity to do that, breaking down that space and showing that it's not, doesn't have to be this white middle class space. It can be something completely different. Um, so for me, that that's the way, of, I mean, it's, I've not really answered your question, but, <laughs> but it's kind of both. Um, but really like, I would say that the first thing for me would be to go and talk to, and find out who the community leaders are, go and talk to them and go, what work should we be putting here? Because we don't know. And so, mm -hmm. um, so it's really about that, I think. Great. Interesting, uh, really helpful, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Anyone else uh, wanna ask a question? I think you can go ahead and unmute yourself if you do. Oh, Avin, great. <laughs> oh, uh, hi, uh, hold on. <laughs> can, you, can you see me? I Hey. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hi, Amina. Thanks for that. That's, that's fascinating. Um, I, I suppose my um, my question is really, aside from asking them what kind of work they would want to see in those theatres, is how I could make my work more appealing to them. <laughs> um, because I think the thing I struggled with was the theatres that like were interested in my play, uh, which I only wrote one, which was done for, um, as a reading with a fimbra. Um, I got the start to get the feeling they were seeing me as a, some kind of golden ticket to get an Asian audience in. However, my play wasn't necessarily suited uh, to what I felt the Asian audience would want. It was something suited to a very tr uh, traditional theatre going audience. Uh, if anything, I felt that my plays are, have enough politics in them that they would scare away uh, traditional uh, Hindu or uh, Muslim tight-knit communities in these areas because they challenge the very conservative ideas that um, in fact hold those immigrant communities together. Um, so the question which is going to appear somewhere in this long, long, long ramble is how do we, how do we encourage more people outside of that traditional mostly white uh, middle-class 
group to come and see work without saying, well, what do you want to see? Because when I asked them, what do you want to see? They said, oh, we're just doing, doing some Diwali stuff this year. Do you know what I mean? And it's kind of, well, I'm not really interested in that. Um, um, I think it's it's important to recognise that that's not what you want to write, and that's fine. If it right. if what you want to see isn't what you want to write, that's absolutely fine. Um, you that you just have to find the right place for it. That that sure. isn't that. Um, also, I would say if any theatre is looking at you as a golden ticket, that is not the right theatre to be taking your show to. Um, the number of times I've been the one token person, and you can and you walk into the room and you can immediately tell um, that that's why you're there, and then you sort of back out. But um, it's it's yeah if that's the work that you want to make you have to find the right space for it and also don't necessarily say that these communities aren't going to want to see your work because because it challenges the ideas um because there might be someone or quite a few people in that community that do want to see work that challenges their ideas i think mm. um both of my parents are muslim so and my mum has I had a professor once who said that real true belief needs to be challenged um, and I think that that's just as, as valid a thing to, to be positing. Um, but if you like, also, if you don't feel that it's right for the audience, that's also fine. You just have to find out who your audience is. Um, I think that's important in any piece of work is because, because a lot of the things that we write, we write kind of for ourselves when we were younger, or we write for this specific person, or we go, do you know what? I really need this person to see inside my head. So it's about figuring out who that is, if it isn't necessarily the audience that the theatre thinks it is. I guess that that's, that's a wonderful answer. But, um, I guess my problem is I'm like now sort of 50 years old and, uh, <laughs> and I've got to that stage where I was thinking, well, actually, my plays are for the traditional white middle class audience. Um, uh, perhaps not as hard hitting as some of the theatres in London, but, you know, maybe the regional theatres, but I come up against the wall of, I don't know whether it's unconscious bias or not, but I wonder how you deal with it, which is that, oh, this place seems like it'd be more interesting for Indians. It's not really something that our, we would attract our normal audience to. So we're sort of caught between two sorts of, actually my plays are for them, but they don't think they are. Um, I will frequently have an argument. That's I know, like that's probably not the right way to. That's probably not the right thing to say. But I think it's fair to challenge them on that, um, and to say, actually, I've written this for theatre, and I've written this for quite a traditional audience. And like, really, just going back to them, going, why are you say, why, what about the play? And make them really sit down and tell you exactly what in the play is making them think that actually it'd be suitable for for this Hindu audience that apparently exists. I also really like that they grouped together this <laughs> um, one audience. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it's, it's fair to challenge them and to go back and say, do you know what? No, that's, that's not a fair assessment of my play. Um, I know that that might lead to the theatre going, we don't want to programme your work, and that is dangerous. Mm. But also, would you want to be programmed somewhere that, that is just expecting you to bring in this audience because of like who you are or because of the color of your skin like nobody wants that um i yeah i i absolutely i absolutely understand that it's difficult and it's it's never an easy conversation to have um but if if you know who your audience is and you're you're confident in that then you're absolutely within your rights to challenge them if they're coming back to you and saying this is who the audience should be mm. okay. thanks that's great thank you um, and question um, oh Yes, so I've got a, I've got a little bit of a queue forming. Oh, um, sorry, you can have that. Okay, don't worry. On, it's all right. No, I'll wait. I'll <laughs> see. Sorry, go. I've got Sumera. Um, do you want to jump on? Great. Yes. Hello. Thank I'll you. <laughs> um, I forgot what I was going to say now. <laughs> She's just handed over to Gary. Um, what I wanted to ask was, um, what's been your biggest challenge? Um so far as a producer in, in trying to do the work that you want to do in the way that you want to do it and, and working with the people you want to do, what, what did you find was the, yeah, the, the biggest obstacle that you kind of had to overcome? And um, as in the one that you overcome and you got over it and yay, success. Uh, and then <laughs> what is the one that you're spying down the road that's coming that you think that uh, that's your kind of next hurdle that you need to jump? Oh, this, that's, oh, what Thank questions? <laughs> really coming with the hard hitting questions. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. Well, okay. So my, my biggest hurdle, I would say, um, I feel probably 
is my age. Um, so I am 20, which is ridiculous. Um, and I've literally just turned 20, so I turned 20 in May. Um, and essentially the way that I dealt with it was by not telling people my age because it doesn't come up um, and just proving that I can do the work. Um, but I'm now very proud of the fact that I'm 20 and a producer because it's, it's nice and it's exciting. But it was a big thing for me because a lot of the time when you say that you're a certain age, people go, oh, well, you can't be responsible or you can't look after this and that. And, and I can very confidently look after a 60K budget and that's fine. Um, it, my own finances are a different story. But <laughs> so I would say that's been my biggest hurdle, which is quite funny because I have a million other things that it really should be. Um, but I've been quite lucky in that I've met a lot of the right people um three different things and through just harassing people which i would say is actually a top tip um just emailing people that you want to meet and want to talk to um and through that they just actually gave me a chance to prove that i could do it um and instead of going well here's a assistant job or an internship or something like that because i was i was a producer and that's how i came out um and so that's what I like that. So that I would say is the challenge that I've overcome. The challenge down the road, um, which is actually, I say down the road, but probably about two houses down, um, is money. Um, a lot of producers who are producing on a larger scale have money. <laughs> I don't. Um, but I, we'll see. I, I have, I'm confident that I'll overcome it as a challenge. There's a lot out there. There's a lot of grants and things and, and there are investors. I just need to find them. Um, but yeah, so that is the thing that I would say is my next challenge is just finding the money because I think somebody put it really well uh, when I was talking to them the other day is that people invest in people who look like them um, and there aren't a lot of people who look like me who have the money to invest in theatre. Um, but yeah, so I would say that's the, that's the next thing, uh, finding someone who's really in, like invested in the same goals as I am and, and wants to give me their money so that I can make them more money down the line. <laughs> um, but yeah, hopefully thank that's you. an adequate answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's great, thank you. Amazing, thank you. Um, I'm gonna go to Catherine and then I'll come back to you, Karine. Uh, Catherine, do you, wanna, do you wanna ask your question? Is Catherine still there? Catherine? Oh yeah, I'm here, can you see me? Oh, yeah, I can see you. Okay. Hi everyone. Lovely to see you. Thanks. That was really refreshing and also your emphasis on the audience and the community. Um, I've been doing a lot of research for things I'm writing into theatre companies which are about sustainability and climate change and climate breakdown and that's a kind of weird example because what I'm beginning to see is it's sort of it's like it is about a community but it can cut through because it becomes global uh, and I see these theatre companies saying, if you're in another country, you know, if you're in the Amazon, for instance, you know, you can send a play, um, which would be amazing, wouldn't it? That sort of working together. But I, I wondered whether you have any experience with this, because I'm doing the research now, but it's a kind of tricky place, you know, there's sort of colonial issues and Black Lives Matter issues going on to ECO because they are there together. And I just wondered, do you have any tips there? In terms of on climate groups, issues? Or on <laughs> groups, groups, theatre groups, or ways of responding to communities. I mean, somebody said to me, why don't you go to a community like where I was born that they got flooded out and do some interviews with them? I think that's a great idea, but I just wondered whether you had any experience with this? Yeah, um, I can't say I've had any first-hand experience with that. Um, but absolutely, there are some really great companies and there is a company that I cannot remember the name of, but they're absolutely amazing. And they did the Jungle um, play, which... The like, yes, the yeah. Um, they're absolutely amazing. And a lot of what they do is about interviewing and then speaking to com the community um, and really getting involved there. Um, and so I, like, I'd look at their work. They're a really great company. Um, and then, well, who else does really? Uh, Tala has just done something really amazing, which is, I cannot remember the name of it. See, this is, this is my problem. Um, but they've just done something really great with frontline workers. Um, so it's all verbatim stuff from frontline workers. Mm -hmm. um, so it is, yeah, there's a lot of different places doing it. And I think when it comes to um, 
like colonial issues in Black Lives Matter and, and things that overlap with work that you're doing, being aware of them in, every, in all of the research that you do is really the best thing. Um, so going into everything and knowing that, and also just going into everything, knowing that you don't know everything is really, mm. really great. Starting um, from scratch is my idea, but I'm totally ignorant and I'm just there to learn. Absolutely. And that's the best way to go about it. And I think getting in touch with getting in touch with the right groups and, and going back to you, to where you're from um, and, and, talk, and like talking to them if, if that fits with what you want to do or actually going to somewhere completely different from where you're from and, and talking to them and finding out <laughs> what their experience is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. so I think absolutely like you've got the right idea and you're going down the right path. If it's something that you want to write about, find the people who've experienced it and talk mm -hmm. to them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Um, Karine, do you want to jump in with your question? <laughs> hi. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Amina. Thanks so much. And everyone at the FIMBA as well. Um, I just was interested um, when you said you don't really want to see um, too many more stories about people's trauma is that is that, i'm interested can you elaborate on on that and the reason and everything and what you mean specifically by that is it kind of like a sort of you don't want to see because i can understand that kind of navel gazy poor me poor me kind of with no story um and just a sort of vomitarium of, of therapy um is that what you is that what you kind of meant or or were you can um, you elaborate? yeah thank you I I think I think thanks for the question. Um, I think a little bit more uh, than that, rather than that, because I think uh, so. It's, since you've been gone, is is a biographical piece of work, but it's is really great. Um, but Teddy, the artist who wrote it, and I both kind of came out of it going, do you know what? We want to use this to then launch other things that aren't necessarily like they're writing. Um, I think it's a musical, but it's definitely a love story. That's it's a trans love story, and that it's just a love story that happens to have two trans main characters um, and so it's really about finding ways to write work that, that includes them and, and includes the, those um, characters and those underrepresented voices without it necessarily being this biographical work about what it like means to to um, to be non-binary and what it means to like grieve and all of those things um, I think there's a lot of value in that work and it can do a lot for an artist and it can be a really great place to start as well um, but I, I just, I think that we should, we should allow people to write about what they want to write about. And it's absolutely fine. If that is trauma, that's fine. But I do think that a lot of people are being put in boxes of, of kind of talk about racism or talk about sexism or talk about this or that. Um, and that's the work that's really championed and is absolutely worth being championed. But I want to see more work that's also not that. And it's still by people who like would have been able to write trauma work, but don't have to, to, to carry on, if that makes sense. It does, absolutely. Thank you, it answers my question. Thank you, yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Um, anyone else want to ask a question? Now's your chance. <laughs> anyone else? You can unmute yourself and jump in. Oh, yay, one more. Uh, Roxana, do you want to jump on? You can you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi everyone, thank you for your patience. Just finding the buttons here. All right. <laughs> Lovely chat. Really enjoyed listening to you, Amina, and really encouraged to see that you're doing so well. I just wondered how much is budget a consideration for you as a producer, and uh, when somebody comes up with a new idea, is that a worry for you if you if the idea seems to you quite big, which requires a lot of actors and stuff? Um, it's not necessarily a worry. It would be a lie to say I'm not always thinking about budgets. I can't help it. I, I can't even watch theatre without thinking about budgets, um, which is really dangerous when you're watching stuff on the West End and you're going, this is not what I make, but that was so expensive. Um, but it, it, it's not necessarily a worry as long as somebody knows what they want to do with something. If somebody comes to me and goes, I want to do a 10 person musical and they're all actor musicians and I want to put it in a 50 seat theater, I'm gonna go, that might not work. <laughs> it might not balance out because you're probably not, you're not gonna make the money. Um, so it, it can be if, if they don't know where they want it to go. But if somebody is writing something for a really large audience, 
um, then that's fine. If that's what they want to write, that's what they want to write. I do find it's difficult. So I, I sometimes get approached by brand new writers who will go, I've written this and I've got this massive space that it's going to hire it out to me for 30k. Um, and I'll go, I don't even know where you're getting the 30k. And then on top of that, it's a really big production. Um, so it is sometimes about kind of going, write that and write that piece. But maybe it's not the like first piece, maybe it's not the second piece, maybe it's the like fifth piece that you do. Um, or you take it to just like the right person. But there are very few people in, in Britain um, developing new musicals that aren't buildings um, or developing new large scale shows, if it is plays, that, that aren't buildings. So I think for me, it can be absolutely, oh, maybe don't do that 10 person um, show in this tiny venue, or maybe don't do that. like. 20 person with kick line dancers and that's just not going to work in this venue but um it's it's not necessarily that i'll go that set idea seems really big because it might be that you go right we're going to get a video designer in and actually you're not going to have a lighting designer but you can have a video designer and that's how we're going to make the space feel a lot larger um so it it can be and it's something that i think about and something i advise on when i talk to people and when i read scripts but it's not necessarily something that i'd shy away from um, it's, it's always something to think about. I can't help it. It's always in my brain now. Um, but yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Let Thank you so much. much. Thanks for your question. Um, any more questions? We're kind of nearing the end, so we can take one more question. Does anyone want to ask? Final question? It is like speaking yeah. to the void. Oh, is that a voice? Oh. No. Oh, sorry. Hey! <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you so much, Ella. Go for it. Uh, hi, uh, I just wanted to ask, because you've got such an amazing catalogue of work that you've produced, and I wonder now, because you've got a great name for yourself, do you have a lot of scripts sent your way, like unsolicited scripts, obviously, um, or do you generally, are you generally approached by writers, or do you approach writers, like what is your, or is it just different every time? Is it always through R&D, or is it, do you like taking on board scripts, I guess is the question. Um, it really depends. Uh, if it is a script, I but well, I have actually been sent probably twenty scripts in the last month, and I read them all, um, <laughs> which is a lot. I still have two sat in my inbox that I do need to read, but I've read most of them. Um, I I do I take I take on scripts, and I take I've taken I took on Killing It, which was at Vault this year, last year, this year, that's <laughs> still this year. God, it feels like ages ago. Um, that. I took on in January and it went, the show went up in February. So it was very much finished um, when it came to me, but it, it really depends on the show. So uh, Eating Myself, which is meant to be going to Battersea Arts Centre, when Pepper brought it to me, didn't really exist. Um, they had a 10 minute piece that they'd done and then they were just going to devise it through a rehearsal process. So sometimes it, it comes to me as, as a full script that is complete and, and ready to go. Um, sometimes it comes to me as a full script that someone will go, I think this is complete and ready to go. And I'll go, I think you could do these things. Um, and sometimes it comes as, as nothing, but it really depends on the show. But right now I, um, well, I'm looking at the, my now 2021 program. Um, it's mainly shows that I got brought, um, either completely finished. Sometimes they've had previous runs. So I'm doing a children's show that is, uh, now doing, uh, an, uh, well not an autumn tour, a spring tour next year um, but it came to me after it had been at Fringe and it really just needed a producer but then some I've also got shows um, that don't exist <laughs> or like it's a lot of different things but mainly right now I get approached by writers because I'm not approaching writers um, but it's definitely something that I do when I have the time <laughs> um, just right now I don't but it yeah it really depends on the show Great, thank you so much. Thank you everyone for asking such great questions and thank you for dealing with all these questions. Um, some of them were very hard hitting and um, yeah, just thank you so much for your time and thank you everyone for coming. I might just sort of can turn your videos on maybe just so we can all see each other if you want um, right at the end. It's always quite nice to see, to see familiar faces. Um, but Amina, you've been absolutely amazing and I, I just have to say the future seems very hopeful uh, listening to you. Um, 
Can we have a recording like last time? It was brilliant yeah, yeah. that recording. We're doing that. Yeah. <laughs> but sometimes there's so many rich things going on, wonderful yeah. comments, and I haven't written it all down when we've been at Fimbra. So it's fabulous yeah. to pass it through again. Absolutely. I think definitely wonderful. something we'll keep for the future. Hi everyone. <laughs> Can we have a drink in the bar now? <laughs> <laughs> Not my well, maybe in a few months. Uh, <laughs> um but yeah, thank you so much, Amina, for your time. Thank and you thank, you. thank you to everyone all. Be sending Thank an email you. out um, to sort of announce the the next speaker. Um, we've got a couple in the pipeline, just just getting dates and stuff. So keep your your eyes on your email. Um, and yeah, if you need anything or you want to talk or, or you know, just please do email Sue and I are at the other end, and, and we're always happy to to receive emails from you. Um, and just sort of before we go and say goodbye, I just thought Neil, maybe you want to jump on and say a couple of words, um, just to sort of uh, uh, no. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. Yay. Hello, hello. Uh, this is working. Um, thank you, Amina. And uh, she didn't plug the show she's doing at the Fimbra next year, which we will uh, announce shortly. Uh, we're just sorting out the image. Um, and uh, we've got lots of, well, the Fimbra is closed, but we're active online. There's lots of shows going out there for free, so you can watch those if you like. Um, and if you want to help us retweet some of our content on Twitter, that would be really helpful. Um, and hope to see you in a few months in the flesh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Neil. Um, thank yeah. you so much, everyone. Have a lovely evening. And, and yeah, again, thank you, Amina. And hopefully we'll all see each other um, one day soon. Yeah. <laughs> see you here next month. Bye-bye. Uh, Take care. Bye. 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 <laughs>